changes to white matter structure. And one of the most famous examples of that um, was a study from 2009, about 10 years ago, where they showed that when people learned how to juggle, this acquired skills accompanied by a change to white matter structure that was measured with the diffusion of the electrical. And where this uh, study is a very famous example, it's certainly not the only one. And actually, many studies have shown that MRI can be used to detect changes to white matter structure as a function of age, disease, cognitive function, uh, and more. And the reason uh, we believe these uh, studies are interesting is because when we find this relationship between some behavior function and a change to white matter structure, uh, we either hope or assume that the change in this MRI measurement actually reflects a change to the underlying microstructure of white matter, which is either the axon structure or the myelin structure. And if there's a change both to white matter structure and to some function, then maybe this implies a change to the white matter function, which is conduction properties of electrical signals. Uh, but this relationship is not well established in vivo, so to shed some light on this relationship, we wanted to relate human parameters in white matter uh, to conduction data using some biophysical framework. Uh, specifically, we're going to use the GHO, that's the ratio between the inner and outer diameter uh, of the magnet sheet that is wrapped around the axon. And there are several reasons for using this measurement. And um, first of all, um, it's been shown since the 50s already to affect conduction. So it's already a good start if you want to say something about conduction. Second, it actually shows to uh, vary, for example, with age. And this is interesting because conduction was also suggested to very with age, actually to be more, uh, to slow with age. And while the results are inconclusive, they support each other. Uh, finally, and maybe most importantly, we can measure it in vivo. Uh, so ever since uh, uh, in 2012, a uh, study came out showing us how to measure uh, GRH using MRI. Many, many, many studies, ourselves included, use this measurement to say something about the brain, and we always motivate our study by saying it's interesting because GRH is conduction. But like I said, in vivo, it's not clear if there's enough evidence. So more specifically, the goal of the study was to test whether the MRI measurement of GHO can be used to model conduction and its changes as a function of age. So I'm gonna start with briefly describing how we can measure GHO using MRI, then how we use this measurement to model conduction, and finally say whether, see where, whether it changes with age or not. All right, so of course when we uh, measure anything with MRI, we don't have access to the single axon duration, but instead we have a voxel containing a large number of, of axons. And to model, to uh, estimate the average duration in a voxel, we need two quantities. The first is the myelin volume fraction. That's a relative volume that is occupied by myelin. That's the blue uh, area right here. And in a previous study, we showed that we can estimate the myelin volume fraction using quantities of MRI, specifically the normal number fraction, if you're familiar with it. The second quantity is the axon volume fraction. That's the relative volume that is occupied by axons, the inner area of the, of the axon. And a previous study, not ours, showed that we can uh, model it or estimate it using a diffusion model. Uh, specifically, in this case, we use NODI, again, if you're familiar. And then we can combine these two maps and uh, create a whole brain GRG map. You can already see uh, a difference between the gray matter and, and white matter, for example. And now, because we do want to say something about conduction along fiber tracks, we set this ratio map along uh, three uh, uh, tracks that we focused on. These are local tracks connecting the frontal, motor, and occipital uh, hemispheres in the human brain. Um, and you can see already some variance between and in the <coughs> tracks, and we can uh, average over them in sagittal the region, uh, creating a single volume per track per sagittal. All right. So, uh, this brings us to the next part of the talk. I've shown you how we can estimate G ratio uh, in, a, in a white metal track, and now how we can, the question is how we can use this measurement to say anything about conduction along this, these tracks. Um, so what I was looking for here was a biophysical model of a myelinated axon, and one that would allow me to play with the parameters and estimate its conduction properties. What I ended up using was uh, an implementation of a numerical simulation uh, uh, published by uh, David Atwell's group. And in this uh, study, they model the axon based on a, a different model um, as an electrical circuit, of course. Uh, and of course, to actually use simulation, I need to, there are many, many parameters which I don't have access to, but I can take most of them from the literature. And then I can incorporate my um, duration measurements and then modify the magnitude sheet thickness, for example, that would modify uh, the properties, the electrical properties of the magnetic membrane. Right, so the resistance and capacitance, for example. 
But of course, T ratio is not enough to do that. I would li line a little bit. And we actually need, oh, sorry, uh, the axon diameter as well. Um, right. So what we initially thought about doing, since we cannot measure the axon diameter, was use the relationship between the G ratio and the axon diameter, which has been shown repeatedly over the literature. The problem with that, as you can see here, this is a, a exit data from array, is that for a single value of G ratio, there's actually a very large range of possible diameters for the axon. And that's a problem because the axon diameter actually affects the conduction velocity quite greatly. And if you don't believe me, I can show you. So this is a result of the numerical simulation for a single axon of these um, uh, geometrical properties. So axon, the G ratio is 0.75, the axon diameter was uh, 1.3 micrometers. And you see here, um, the voltage is a function of time, which line here represents the voltage of a different node. And the two no uh, lines here represent the 20th, 20th node which is just how we can calculate the velocity. Now if I go just slightly to the right, um, so same duration, different axis diameter, and you can already see that the conduction velocity is more than twice as large. So we cannot use this information, but what we can do is take a axon diameter from the literature. So luckily, or not so luckily, intentionally, we're focused on the corpus callus, which is one of the only regions in the human brain where there is post-mortem data um, containing a axon diameter distribution. So this was published in 92 by Boitis, and I uh, uh, calculated the weighted average of the distribution to match my uh, volume weighted measurement, basically, of GHO. And then I checked uh, what would these values of axon diameters, which are um, 1.7, 2.8, 1.3, uh, respectively, for the different regions. And for a biological range of G ratio values, I find that the velocity is around 10 meters per second, which is what you can expect in the in the central nervous system. Right, so kind of to, uh, the, to summarize the framework, what we do for each subject is assume uh, axon diameter for different regions from the literature, and measure the G ratio per tract, incorporate these values in, in, a, in a numerical simulation, and then you can extract the conduction velocity per tract per subject. Right, so now that we have both the G ratio measurement, a way to model conduction, the question is, uh, how these uh, properties change with age. For that, we uh, uh, have uh, 20 younger and 60 more subject. The data was collected by Shear, who has a talk later today, which you should check out, which would be very cool. Um, and here in the ENU. And what we find is the following. So first, looking at uh, the G ratio values, uh, we see a slight increase in G ratio in the motor track between younger and older subjects, so the older ones are here in orange. And uh, an increase in G ratio means less myelin, which is expected. And again, as expected, this leads to a small decrease in this tract for uh, the conduction velocity. Not very large, but uh, almost significant. <laughs> um, now we can combine the con conduction velocity with a fiber tract that is uh, measured from the photography results to uh, calculate the conduction time. Um, so the fiber tract was not different between young and older subject, the length. Um, and uh, respectively, the, the latency was not, the conduction time or conduction delay was not different between younger and older subjects. This is already interesting uh, because the literature does suggest there should be a delay in conduction time and age. And we believe this is probably mainly uh, because by fixing the axon diameter between young and older subjects, we're losing important information. If the duration changes, there's no reason the axon diameter is going to change with age as well. So this is what we believe. Um, all right, so the next thing we did, uh, I'll show you that the average values of duration does not change with age, but you can already see that there's a lot of variance within tract, um, and maybe that is something that uh, changes with age. So to model this variance within tract in a more uh, biophysically interpretable way, we turned the, the ver variance within uh, tract to local field potential. We did that uh, using a, a, some code that I adapted from a paper by the Mozart. And the idea is the following. So for each single streamline, there is a G ratio in length. So I can assign it or map to it a single conduction time. Uh, for this specific streamline, it's about six uh, um, milliseconds. Now I take random uh, noisy voltage over time and use that timing that the latency is uh, the latency of an input neuron. Now I can integrate it over time. This would be kind of a, a, a pseudo input neuron. Since I have a, lo a lot of streamlines, uh, I have a distribution of latencies, and I can uh, 
look at the, the voltage of over time for all of these lenses, each lens with, with a different streamline or neuron, and when I sum over that, I get a really nice local field with LFP looking shape. And that allows me to extract the width of the LFP, not just the peak time, and have some interpretable uh, measure. Um, so I did that for all subjects, and you see here the different, uh, uh, the different colors representing the different tracks. The solid line is the younger subjects, the dashed line is the older subjects. And you can already see that uh, uh, the difference between tracks is much more salient than the difference uh, between younger and older subjects. But what we did find that was interesting is a small increase in the width of the LFP in older subjects. And what, while we did not find any literature that actually tested this directly, and there is some evidence suggesting that the differences with age are more in the variance of things and not in the averages. And so to summarize, we provided a biophysical framework that allows us to relate q and parameter and the space ratio to conduction in mathematical fiber. And then we then use it to test whether the variance in G-ratio can allow us to uh, detect changes in conduction between younger and older subjects. We find very small changes uh, and we think that should it suggests we should improve our uh, other structural measurements like acting diameter and maybe focus on more uh, variance in the data <coughs> instead of looking at the uh, So thank you to my advisor and my lab and for listening.